Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. And I feel really fortunate to be able to speak to this group as well about the Failed Implant Device Alliance and what a large group of us have been doing recently. So this will be an update. And I'm, I'm going to end it with the, the most important thing is talking about the indemnity and justice that we're looking for failed implant devices. But first, let me go back to the beginning. The few of you that might not know the story, at least I can remind you of the story about how I got started. My blog is the Failed Implant Device mm -hmm. Alliance. And you can see from the logo that it starts at a point that's when somebody thinks of an idea of a device, and it's supposed to go through a complete cycle of review so that we know that these devices are both functional and safe. I have been trained at the FDA, at the CDRH, to be a patient representative, but what I learned at that time in 2010 was that there's even less scrutiny of devices than there is of the pharma. So I became a patient advocate, but the work, as you can tell from FIDA, I was flying home from a very dissatisfying meeting at the FDA where I had been marginalized as a patient advocate at this meeting. And I thought, what could I do? And so I started FIDA with the tiny I for implants. And the word failed. It was really important for me to tell them that these devices had failed. In my blog, what I try to do is I try to direct people that I've learned have been harmed by devices to the blog because they can quickly get up to speed on what's been going on. I am not personally writing the blog. What I'm doing is I'm compiling information from credible resources and um, investigative reporters um, and putting that information together and I highlight it. Um, so that people can get the data that they need very quickly and the contact information to themselves be their own pa patient advocates. And the next slide is a picture of me with my brother. My brother was harmed in 2001. He's a millwright. He was hurt on the job by a criminal act by a fellow coworker who was on cocaine at the time. So Stephen hurt his elbow at that time. And for the next seven years, almost every year, he had to have another implant. He had plates and screws and they would come loose and he'd go back in and always had a good relationship with his orthopedic surgeons. And he's from Minnesota. I live in Texas. I got a call from him in 2008. In 2008, he was told that there was an elbow replacement that he should consider. And so he got that and four months later, he had to have it revised. A revision means that they go back in surgically, and what we were told, you can see from the slide down below, that's actually two pieces. It's a head and a stem, and the doctor said that those two components would be put back together again. But when I read through the medical report, it said that those two components had been removed. And it took me over a year in lawyers to get those two components back to us. And that's what made me suspicious. That's when I got more involved with what was going on with my brother. And the rest basically is history. I thought I could write a, a letter to his doctor and they could make this right for him and take care of him. But what I found was that the, the doctor didn't want to talk to us about a failed device. We did a certified registered letter asking that we could talk to the trustees about it. And there was no response from that. We tried the Joint Commission, and they said, we don't oversee this. You'll have to contact your doctor in your hospital. So it was a lot of protocol that we had to go through. None of it really worked very well. And we contacted Tornier, which was the manufacturer, basically to see if we could see the, the elbow component. They didn't want to talk to us. This is my business card, the flip side of my business card. And this is my mission, to have a device warranty. We don't want to have the surgeons have to have the warranty. We want the device itself. If it breaks like my brothers did, there should be a warranty on it. There was an Implant Safety Act that did not pass with the Affordable Care Act, and we know now that uh, with the new administration that they're fast-tracking devices. An independent registry, this has not happened. We have some orthopedic surgeons who have basically co-opted the, the registry, and then patient consumer stakeholder rights 
there's some movement within the FDA to give patients some voice. But it is the job of the FDA and the CDRH to produce safe and effective devices. I'll go over several that are problematic. Eshore, Dr. Scott Sills, and the Eshore Harmed Women have allied together, which has been brilliant. Uh, he's not the only doctor who has become very courageous in talking very honestly about these coils that have been inserted into women's fallopian tubes. They're produced by Bayer. It's a German corporation, like baby aspirin Bayer. They, once they're in the fallopian tube, they're to scar over to make the woman sterile. And these are permanent implants. But we have found that they migrate, they puncture organs, and for a lot of the women, when they come back into the doctor's office, they're told, oh, it couldn't possibly be the Eshore. It must be something else. Or the doctors don't even know what Eshore is. Fortunately, Dr. Scott Sills recognized what the problem was. He had several patients and has now started to write some protocol on how to remove these devices and also to help the women to compile real-life information and data. The problem with uh, having the companies, the manufacturers, compile information about patient outcomes is that they don't often do a good job of that, nor is it in their interest to show when a device fails. So these are the devices that uh, look pretty mean to go into a woman's soft tissue in her pelvis. And down below is one of the first collections of data by these women. They call the Esure Problems page on Facebook. And they've been compiling information about women who have had to have hysterectomies since the device has come out. Another device is the pelvic surgical mesh. And you can see from the slide that that's a polypropylene, which is a petroleum industry byproduct that's been implanted in the or hernia mesh in men. And it has been very problematic. And very recently on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Jane Aker who's been a wonderful investigative journalist who's taken it upon herself to write Mesh News News Desk, had a really good conversation about this device and how difficult it has been to have it recognized as being a failed device. In Britain, it now has been banned, and there's a group called Sling the Mesh, and Kath Sansom is the founder of that. And she's also a journalist. And she did a brilliant job of bringing women to the British Parliament to talk to the various commissions about this device. And as social media has been a brilliant way of having the harm patients be able to connect with one another, get honest information as quickly as possible, disseminate that information, and also to collect the information on the data from the patient outcomes. And down below on the slide, you see Judge Goodwin. He is in Charleston, West Virginia, in federal district court. He has 100,000 harmed women waiting for justice from, I think it's seven different manufacturers of this mesh product. It is one of the largest scandals ever in medical history. The other one that I just wanted to talk about briefly was the chromium and cobalt hips. Stephen Tower, I don't know if he's on today. I don't think he is was one of the first patient advocates. He is a doctor and he is an orthopedic surgeon who also had implanted this medical hip himself and ran into the toxic problems of cobalt chromium. I was at, uh, as an observer in Dallas, at the Johnson & Johnson pinnacle hip trial. Mark Lanier was the plaintiff lawyer and the verdict was for $1 billion for six plaintiffs from California who had been harmed by this pinnacle hip with cobalt and chromium. There's a woman, Frances Scott, who is a former journalist, who has also got two of these devices in her. I called her in Austin because I had met her online, and I said, you've got to get up to Dallas to be here at the closing arguments. And when she was there, you can see the artwork that was done. She did that because neither of us were allowed to bring in our computers as observers. So she did a pencil drawing of that. But the $1 billion verdict, while it's very impressive, was immediately appealed because Johnson & Johnson and many of these manufacturers immediately appeal their, any verdict. It gets dragged on forever, and people oftentimes don't live to see any kind of compensation. It was interesting. There were nine jurors, and they...
agreed on this. There were 26 counts, and they had to do it for each individual plaintiff, and they pulled this verdict together in less than a day. It was because uh, Mark Lanier had said, listen, if you don't punish them with money, we can't put these people in jail. It has to be only the money. So I'm going to end with talking to you about corporate indemnification, which refers to the act of compensating one or more directors, officers, employees, or agents of a company for liability personally incurred on the job. Many, many, many corporations have this, that as they're incorporating, they start a fund which protects anybody who works for that company so that they have already a fund to fund the lawyers for anything that they might do. It's supposed to be only if they do something legal. And so far, we've only seen criminal trials for these harmful products. What I am saying is that we really need to make these criminal trials because these companies know that they continue to implant a device that's going to cause problems. And the problems usually come not in the first few months. So they'll say, huzzah, we have a brand new product that does great. But what if you are the patient gets implanted and the toxic whatever they put in your body doesn't show up for 10 years? You need to be helped, and it, it's very, very expensive to be taken care of, and the fines are not stopping these people from continuing to sell. So I will close just saying again, there are a number of devices. The other one that I didn't mention was the power morselator. And Human Norchasm and Dr. Amy Reed were the ones who were so outspoken about the power morselator that several different manufacturers make. Dr. Amy Reed was the one who her sarcoma was spread by using this when she had a hysterectomy, I think it was about two years ago. She has passed away this spring after having the sarcoma and has left six children and a very courageous husband who has spoken out. Both of them put themselves on the line, they and their careers on the line, to speak out about these devices. So please make sure that you are supporting your patient advocates that speak out. We don't all speak with a medical degree or with a legal degree, but we should not have to have that to be able to have a microphone. And I again want to thank Dr. Kavanaugh from deep in my heart for this opportunity to speak today. And thank you guys for listening, those of you especially who've heard it before.